is a blessing to look across the screen and see so many uh, familiar, uh, and in some cases not so familiar, uh, faces and names uh, joining us for this month's Douglas Leadership Institute and Frederick Douglass Foundation uh, Leaders Live Call. As you'll know, we do these calls monthly, and uh, they are always intended to uh, encourage and to equip and to inspire um, you all with uh, credible information, um, quality um, speakers, and, um, and practical resources to be able to help further leverage uh, the kingdom initiatives that you all are doing in your various cities and states across the nation. Uh, my name's Arnold Colbreth. I'm Douglas. Uh, <laughs> I have the director of leader. <laughs> what am I? <laughs> director of ministry engagement, excuse me. Shifting gears with various hats uh, gets a little confusing sometimes. The director of ministry engagement with the Douglas Leadership Institute. And I'm really honored uh, and blessed to uh, be here tonight. Uh, we want you all to know we at the Douglas Leadership Institute and the Frederick Douglass Foundation want you all to know that we love you. Uh, we appreciate you, we value you, and we're grateful for uh, the various partnerships that we have with uh, your churches and with your organizations, and especially with you uh, individually. So uh, tonight we have an incredible uh, uh, guest speaker, uh, Dr. Anthony Bradley. We've had him on before, uh, but uh, tonight is going to be no less uh, impactful and uh, and inspiring as we uh, delve into the topic. And uh, I'm really excited tonight before I open us with a word of prayer, uh, I'm going to hand the floor over to uh, Michaela Nelson. Uh, we are very passionate about uh, the generations coming up behind us and uh, empowering them and, and releasing them uh, to continue the work. And um, I'm, I'm so excited about Michaela Nelson uh, being in the role of a uh, of moderator for tonight's discussion. Uh, she is the eldest child of the late Bishop Dean Nelson. So it's really cool to see her. Uh, she's been working with the Douglas Leadership Institute for quite some time behind the scenes and sometimes in front of the scenes. But tonight you'll get the opportunity to see her, to hear her, to catch her heart and to, uh, to, to actually uh, sense uh, the mantle that rested on her father, Bishop Dean Nelson, uh, flowing through her as well. So let me open us with a word of prayer. Uh, before I do that, uh, these calls are uh, always intended for ministerial engagement and equipping, and they are not intended for the press. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And we are so grateful to you for another opportunity to, uh, to just lean in to, uh, to learn and to receive and to apply uh, new information, new resources, Father God. In some cases, things will be shared that we've heard before, but perhaps have, have fallen to the back of our minds and, and you, Holy Spirit, will intend to bring it more to the front of our minds. Father, we, think, we thank you for Dr. Bradley, Father God, and just all of the experiences and uh, and and capacity that you've given him, Father God, cause tonight's uh, presentation to just flow powerfully and in an anointed kind of a way, Father God. Father, for those on the call, Father God, live tonight, uh, perhaps have had long and in some cases challenging days. Help us to be alert and to to uh, be responsive, Father God. Uh, we thank you in advance for all that you're going to do tonight, and it's in Jesus's name we pray. Amen. I yield the floor to Michaela Nelson. <laughs> thank you so much, Apostle Colbreth. And thank you all for being here tonight. We're really excited about um, our guests and also uh, the topic we're going to be talking about. So I'll do a quick uh, introduction for our guest today, Dr. Anthony Bradley. Um, he was most recently a professor of religious studies and director of the Center for the Human excuse me, for the study of human flourishing at the King's College. He's a theologian in residence at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, Lincoln Square, and now serves as a distinguished research fellow at the Acton Institute. Dr. Bradley lectures at colleges, universities, business organizations, uh, and churches throughout the US and abroad. 
Um, his writings on religious and cultural issues have been published in a variety of journals, including the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Washington Examiner, Al Jazeera, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the Detroit News, Christianity Today, and World Magazine. Um, Dr. Bradley is called upon by members of broadcast media for comment on current issues and has appeared in many different outlets. Uh, he studies and writes on issues of covenant theology, criminal justice reform, youth and family, poverty, education policy, social ethics, and race in America, which are all uh, really important topics that we uh, like to talk about here at the Douglas Leadership Institute. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Biological Sciences from Clemson University, a Master of Divinity from Covenant Theological Seminary, and a Master of Arts and Ethics, um, excuse me, a Master in Ethics and Society from Fordham University, and his PhD is from Westminster Theological Seminary. So, Dr. Bradley, uh, thank you so much for being on here today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So before we uh, jump into our topic, I would like for you to just share a little bit about uh, kind of your journey and your career and what's inspired you to just study these different topics, kind of crossing church, race, um, and culture. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I was I was raised in Atlanta, Georgia, as, as W.B. Du Bois would say, I'm an, an Atlanta Negro. Uh, so I was I was raised in, sitting on the the laps of of those who marched with Dr. King, uh, those who were graduates of Morehouse and Spelman and Clark, uh, AKAs and Kappas and Qs, et cetera. I'm an alpha uh, myself. So I was sort of raised in a in a a, a, a United Methodist community uh, in in Atlanta. That given the the time in the era, we're talking about the 70s and, and 80s. Uh, there was always an intersection of the church and the culture and the community. Uh, that's just something the black church did uh, on the regular. And so I was always someone who cared about that intersection of both what the church was doing, but also how it impacted the community. And that's something that just really tracked my my entire career. And so as I've navigated through the academic uh, journey to get me here today, that's just something that I've I've always sort of kept right in in the front and and center of of my work. Most recently, I I began really thinking about these issues when I started doing youth ministry in St. Louis, and I started to notice, particularly in in, in black communities, that we were losing our men, uh, we were losing our boys uh, to all sort of things. It was really impacting the rest of, of church life, in particular marriage and family. And I have never been able to shake that. I mean, I, I, I live in the data. I see the data. And some of that data isn't really uh, encouraging uh, right now. And I think the enemy uh, is active in trying to destroy our churches and our communities by, by destroying things like marriage and by destroying our boys and, and men and our women. Uh, as well. So those are some of the the issues and, and personal burdens that I have in terms of that, that have really encouraged and, and inspired my own work, uh, really trying to trying to outsmart, uh, outflank uh, what the enemy is trying to do to to, to uh, destroy people. Right. It says, it says in in uh, first Peter five, eight, that your, your enemy, the devil, prowls well like a lion uh, waiting to devour you up. And, and I've seen that in community after community after community, uh, how, how the enemy is 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 alive and, and trying to do a lot of damage. So my own personal orientation, I get this from 1 John uh, 3, 8, right? That that Jesus, that it says in this, in, in part of that verse, that the reason Jesus came uh, was to undo the work of the devil. And so one of the ways in which I frame my own work is trying to assist and equip uh, the church in undoing uh, the devil's work wherever it is. Yeah, absolutely. And that's uh, I think so important, and I think is going to really show through in what we talk about later today of uh, why that intersection is so important today. Um, so I think I just want to start with our uh, main topic of the evening, and that is uh, 
what I think we are calling either the boyhood crisis or just the masculinity crisis in America. I think a lot of people on this call may be uh, aware of, you know, these trends, you know, lower attendance for men in college, um, I think lower attendance for men in churches, things like this. But could you give us uh, just some of the scope of what this problem really is um, and just some background? Yeah, so it, it's it's important when I when I mention some of this data, I want everyone to be aware that it's two or three times worse, particularly in low income black communities. Right. It's worse. So there's this national data. So we have the data that says that that boys are falling behind girls in every single subject, in every grade, in every school in America, period. They they lag. They lag behind girls in math, reading, and it doesn't matter what grade it is, K to 12, they, they, they fall behind there. We're seeing a dramatic, dramatic decrease in, in boys graduating high school. That's beginning to tail off. Only 42% of all college degrees were granted to young men last year. Wow. Beginning in the fall of 2021, and this trend is still persisting 61% of all incoming incoming college students are women uh, and so we're losing we're losing our guys uh, it, it, people think well maybe they're going into trades they're not going into trades either what's happening in in the trades is there's a trade shortage and 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 in part that trade shortage is being met by immigration so immigrants are doing a lot of those jobs. Right now, we have about 9 million men who are not working. These are able-bodied men. So that age range is between 24 and 54, able-bodied men. They're not in trades. They're not in school. They're not working. They're doing nothing on record. They may be gigging. So maybe they're doing DoorDash or Uber deliveries, but they're not in the full-time uh, workforce, which is really, really alarming. We also are having massive, massive problems, particularly in the black community with marriage. Uh, the most recent data says that 50% of black women in this country are never going to get married. In 2030 in Atlanta, by 2030, 60% of black women in Atlanta are not going to get married. If you look at Howard University right now, Howard University is 75% women. So these disparities have really, really alarmed us. And, and there are all sorts of reasons why this has happened, but it's, it's pretty dire. And if we think about the institutions of marriage and family, we think about the institutions like the church, we think about church leaders, we think about, we think about godly men in the workforce, where are they going to come from? Uh, right now, we're having massive, massive problems because they're simply not there. And it's a crisis. It's a real, real crisis. And when you drill that down to low-income communities, it's even worse, Right. And and it, it's not just, for example, that young men aren't working, that they're not in college, that often in communities that that suffer from from joblessness, a lot of those young men are more likely to involve themselves in criminal deviance, which means they're more likely to enter into the criminal justice system. So right. institutions like marriage and families and jobs and all these things are really, really important. And like I said, we have the data nationally. But for particularly uh, for, for black men and black women, it's even it's even much, much worse. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, that robust uh, answer. I think it gives us all a really good idea of, you know, truly how severe this issue is. Um, one thing I'd like to discuss is um, just kind of how did we get here? Right. Um, these things don't happen overnight. Um, there are usually a lot of different factors that go into, um, you know, an issue becoming this bad. So could you maybe give us uh, two to three uh, reasons that you see as to uh, why we're in this situation? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So 
I think we have sort of two forces, maybe three, I would I, I, I would say that are at work here. I, I think one is clearly a breakdown in in family and particularly in black, the black family, and particularly the family in low income communities. I mean, that's really been a struggle. Middle class people tend to do middle class things. But low income communities really struggle from a marriage culture that is dissolved. And that has perpetuated, and the, the data is really clear on that. It perpetuates cycles of, of family and marriage breakdown. And that really precipitated from a lot of the policies, the government policies from the late 60s and early 70s, particularly in, in low income neighborhoods where men and women were discouraged. Uh, from from getting married, or they would lose their AFDC benefits. They would lose their public housing, and and they would they would by the way make decisions on the basis of of keeping of keeping some of those some of those benefits. So there's a real there's a real policy part, particularly in, in low income communities, and it's just created a culture where where marriage and family isn't normed. Having kids is normed, but marriage and family isn't normed. Now, what, here's what we know from the data. And I've seen this in my own work in Harlem over the last uh, 10, 10 years, is that, is that what, what establishes a family and what is it that encourages a man to commit himself to a woman and commit himself to, to children is a very secure and stable job. So when the when the jobs disappeared, what happens, particularly with a lot of men, is they lose their confidence, their interests and their capacity to feel like they can take on a family. Okay. So you have, on the one hand, some policies that undermine the family. On the second, on, on the other hand, you had a lot of joblessness. The, the jobs moved away. Right. So the jobs left the community, the jobs left the neighborhood. And when I say jobs, I, I don't I don't mean simply, you know, working part time at Target. I mean, I mean, the kind of job that that builds a man's capacity. It builds his sense of dignity. It builds his 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 skill set. Um, he's advancing. Right. There's a there's a, a a sense of development there where he becomes better at his job and and eventually a leader. So we're talking about gainful, gainful employment. And when I was in Harlem, I saw this, right? We, I used to do a lot of work with formerly incarcerated uh, men and women. And, and there was this one, one young man who, was, who had fallen into the drug culture and uh, found himself incarcerated. And as soon as he got out, he became a plumber's apprentice uh, in, in New York. And as soon as he got that job, it's like his nesting impulse was activated. And all of a sudden, he wanted to get married. He wanted to bring the children into his own apartment. He wanted to get his own place, right? He wanted to do the sorts of normal things that, that, that men want to do. So, so the absence of jobs is critically important in the formation and the stabilization of families. We also have to have policies uh, that don't undermine people's in, that, that, that don't undermine people's pursuit of the institution of marriage that that encourages those sorts of unions. I'll give a, another example. This church that I was serving at, and again in Harlem, uh, there was a young man in his early 20s uh, living with his partner, his girlfriend. They had two kids. They were living in subsidized housing. And she had a, he had a part-time job. She has a part-time job. And he told me, that if they get married, based on the regulations and the, the the low income housing statutes in New York City, if they get married and and, and merge their their banking accounts, they're gonna lose their apartment. Yeah. Right. Wow. So so what did he do? Yeah. They didn't get married. They were just living together with the kids, but they are but they are 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 not married. The the third variable is this, and this one's really unfortunate, is that the schools have been really structured for girls advancement, I'd say for the last probably 30, 40 years. Okay. So, so the way schools are managed, the way schools are, are organized, the way teachers teach, 
those sorts of orientations, I would say beginning in the late 70s, early 80s, as a way to address some of the issues with the marginalization of girls and, and, and women in the past, there was a hyper correction. And the focus was on, on advancing and educating and elevating girls and young women. Well, unfortunately, the boys got left behind. And so the average K-12 classroom is really designed in terms of teaching style for girls. What, one of the things that we see in some of the private charter schools that are all boys is very high academic achievement. But when it's in a co-ed environment, it's it's the girls almost always succeed. It's gonna it's gonna be pretty rare that you'll find a predominantly minority high school where a where a black boy is the valedictorian or the salutatorian or is winning scholarships academically. It's gonna almost always be be the girls. The teachers teach the girls, uh, boys because they often, particularly in early the early elementary years, they're fidgety. A lot yeah. of them for all sorts of reasons that are not their fault. They have impulse control problems, right? They have uh, they have delayed gratification issues. A lot of them are, uh, some, some would say they, they, they've been diagnosed with, with ADD and, and ADHD and, and they're controlled and managed typically out of the classroom. Right. right. And so we've done away with things, the sorts of things that boys need during school, like recess. You've got to run a boy in the middle of the day to get all that energy out. You can't just sit there. So boys, so boys sort of start to fall away in middle school. And when they start to fall away in middle school, that that downward spiral continues in high school and they lose interest in in learning. Uh, and that is really, really unfortunate. And so those are those are some of the variables uh, that have that have gotten us here. And what's interesting, right, is that those are also the the, the areas that we can talk about a, a little later in terms of solutions as a way yeah. of, of of addressing those things. And we can also talk about this later as well. The church has a unique opportunity if if churches are willing to pursue it. And I've got some ideas on that. Awesome. Yeah, we'll make sure we uh, get to that before our time is up. Uh, one thing that I did want to circle back to on the family piece is um, the importance of fathers. I think all of us on this call know um, having, uh, you know, fathers, involved fathers, um, good, strong role models are, I think, important for boys and girls. But um, could you talk a little bit more about just how important that is kind of in the data? Yeah, it's it's vital. So one, one one of the things that I say is that that fathers are the most important men in, in, in any community anywhere ever, period. Uh, fathers are correlated, and I could spend a whole hour talking about some of these data points here, but fathers are correlated with all sorts of outcomes for both women and children. I'll stick with children. Uh, just to give you an, an idea, the, when I say the majority, I mean like 70 to 80 percentile in terms of in terms of prevalence. If you look at at, at juveniles who struggle with addiction, 70 80 percent of those kids are going to come from homes without dads. When you look at runaways from home, again, over 70 percent are going to come from fatherless homes. When you look at for mental health issues, again, it will be it will be predominantly a kids who would come from fatherless homes. Seventy percent of all the kids in the juvenile system are are come from come from fatherless homes. Uh, fathers are associated with academic achievement, so kids who get A's and B's in school are more likely to come uh, from homes with with active fathers. Fathers are correlated with faith persistence, and we have really hard data on this, that one of the measures that predicts children persisting in their faith into adulthood is whether or not their fathers are involved in their life on two areas. One, their father being warm, so so their, their, their dad's being a, a place of, of safety and comfort, but then secondly, their dad's actually engaging them in terms of theological and biblical discipleship and learning and teaching. 
the the more dads are involved in kids' lives as terms of spiritual formation, the more likely those kids are going to persist uh, in their in their faith. One of the things that the data shows, which typically surprises people, is that children learn empathy primarily from their fathers, not their mothers. It is fathers who are the rule enforcers, or it's fathers who are the ones who position their children to be other-centered, right? So it's fathers who are telling kids, do what your mom says. It's fathers who are telling the, their children they need to respect their elders. It's fathers who are saying, nope, you need to get up and get ready to go to school, go to church, whatever. It's fathers who are saying, your mom told you to take a shower, go take a shower. So, so it's actually fathers who are positioning their children to think about other people. I was recently listening to a story. Or actually, I, I, I saw a video of, of a dad uh, who was talking to his son. And they had done they were doing some yard work and they were really tired. And he's like, son, I'm tired and, and I know you're tired. And but I want to tell you this. When we go in that house. Uh, your mother is going to need us to dig down deep and get some energy because your three, you know, your, your three brothers are going to have some needs and your mom is going to need my help in helping her finish to prepare dinner. So when we go in there, when we go in there, we're gonna have to serve both your mom and your brothers. So one brother is going to want to go play catch. Another brother is, is going to want to uh, uh, talk. Another brother is going to want to be held because he's an infant. And, and so he was telling his son, when you become a man one day, when you become a father, uh, this is what you're going to have to do. And then he went in the house and showed him what it meant to be a husband who was serving uh, his wife and his children. That's the sort of empathetic, other-centered formation that fathers uniquely offer. Lastly here, the empathy piece is really important because when, when fathers are not deeply involved in their children and children don't develop empathy, they're much more likely to have behavioral issues and also much more likely to find themselves engaging in criminal deviance, right? So, so empathy makes you care if you are about to take somebody's clothes, watch, car, because you're thinking about the impact that it's gonna have on somebody else. If you don't have empathy, you don't care that you're damaging somebody's property or taking it somebody's life. You just don't care. And so fathers are absolutely critical, absolutely critical in, in some of those variables. And the, the data is just really, really clear. And so one of the things that churches would really benefit their communities and us of the country is to really invest in supporting and, and strengthening fathers and offering fathers opportunities to grow and, and, and to mature because as we serve and, and develop and mentor and teach and grow fathers, it has an impact in so many other areas uh, within the context of a, of a community. I mean, kids, for, kids are not going to find themselves uh, struggling with, with, with the, the sorts of things, the sorts of pathologies that we often see if their fathers are deeply involved in their in their lives. And like I said, the data is really clear on this. One one last data point here that, that I, I find interesting that people tend to tend to like is that when fathers wrestle in rough house with their children, it is like a magic formation pill. Wow. When when fathers physically wrestle, physically rough house with their kids, and this is true for boys in particular, the more dads wrestle with their kids, the less likely the, the boys are, are going to struggle from porn addiction and video game addiction. When fathers rough house with their sons, they teach them delay gratification. They teach them impulse control. They also teach them their bodies can hurt other people. So they learn they can't, they can't poke dad there. They can't stick an elbow there. They can't touch that, right? And so they, they learn that their, that their bodies matter. But also when fathers are physically engaged with their children in terms of play and rough housing, rough and tumble plays, it was what the, the, 
data says it releases two hormones, uh, oxytocin, uh, which is the love hormone, and dopamine, uh, which is the feel-good ho- hormone. And so when, when, when fathers are engaged in play with their children and they're releasing both dopamine and oxytocin, it bonds them together and it builds trust and intimacy. So what happens is that when the kids are teenagers, they're much more likely to come to their dads uh, with their problems and issues because they know their fathers love them and they trust them because of all the sort of the, the groundwork that was built. Uh, through through some of those uh, uh, mechanisms, you know, whatever whatever dads get excited about, whatever fathers get excited about, their children will get excited about. And again, yeah. the data is really clear on that. If a dad is a is a fan of the Philadelphia Eagles, the kids will be Philadelphia Eagles fans. Yeah. If if, if the dad is is a fan of algebra, the kids will be fans of algebra. If the father is a fan of the Lord, the children will be fans of the Lord. One of the crazy data points I've heard recently is that one of the greatest predictors of children persisting in their faith is watching their father sing during worship. Wow. Right? Just watching him sing by itself is predictive of children persisting in their faith. And so for those reasons and a whole other reason, like I said, I could do this for 45 minutes. Uh, I, I, I'm content. I, I will, I, I will pledge allegiance on this. I will die on this hill, uh, that fathers are all the most important men in any community and uh, anywhere ever. And yeah. that, and that pastors, one of the, one of the roles that pastors have, I would argue is to serve fathers. Uh, as as the Bible calls fathers uh, to to uh, lead and to steward their families in, in all sorts of areas. Yeah, I really love that. Um, I'll say fun data point about uh, the rough housing. I did not know that, but I think that's that's amazing. Um, I will also quickly add, um, we've put a copy of, or excuse me, a link to our Black Family Report that the Douglas Leadership Institute has done. Uh, for those of you on the call, if you have not had a chance to check that out, um, I would encourage you to do so. Uh, it's a really wonderful report that we um, have had out for a little bit, but uh, definitely um, highlight some of the same information we've been talking about on this call. Um, one last point before we kind of get into solutions um, that I wanted to discuss briefly was on the topic of youth mental health. I think with this boyhood crisis, um, and I think just, you know, some of the issues we're having with youth mental health in general, um, you kind of have to talk about both issues, right? So could you just give us um, an idea of uh, kind of what's going on with our youth with mental health? And I think uh, specifically uh, for boys. Um, I studied public health in college and part of what I did research was um, suicide prevention. And do know that uh, rates of suicide for young men is um, just disproportionately higher than it is for women. So. Could you uh, just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's in fact it's about three to four times higher uh, for 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 boys for for men than, than women. There are three major uh, spikes in in suicidal risk, particularly for boys. One is fifteen to twenty four. That's a really really critical age. The second one is forty five to fifty four. And the last one is 65 and, and older. Those are critical. Those are critical periods to be engaged, particularly with, with men and, and mental health. We are beginning to see that with girls, we are we we seen like a three to four uh, a times uh, a increase in the last ten years. I'd say since 2000, since uh, let's see, but since like 2012 or so. We've seen a massive increase in girls who have self-harmed themselves and end up in the emergency room. Wow. And and that's precipitated the conjecture currently is that, that that's that's precipitated often by social media. Uh, particularly girls are engaged in self-contempt and self-hatred uh, because they they compare themselves to the the girls and other women they see on social media. 
and it's causing them to stress. So they're having anxiety and depression spikes, which leads to self-harm, which leads to the sorts of things that we see in, term, in terms of them landing in uh, emergency rooms. Now, what the data also says, which is, which is really surprising to me, is that the, the, the incidence of, of African-American youth who are choosing suicide has drastically changed. It is much, much higher than it's ever been ever in this country's history. And so now we have a new epidemic, a new crisis, because now the sorts of communities which didn't used to present suicidal ideation is presenting that now. And so, and so I've, I've seen recent years where, where young black athletes, particularly football players, have taken their lives, which is something that we wouldn't normally see in in the data, and and in general for young adults, we're seeing a pretty pretty massive spikes in in anxiety, and and depression. One of the things that I'm seeing, particularly for young men, is is them managing their anxiety and depression by resignation, by withdrawal by pulling away, by hiding, by disappearing, by disconnecting and isolating and trying to be self-sufficient and, and, and independent. And I, I just wrote something today on this because the, the uniform for boys and young men who have resigned, they're checked out, is a hoodie. It's the hoodie pulled over the head with headphones on. What's it saying? Don't talk to me. Leave me alone. I don't want to be bothered. Don't ask me to do anything. Don't make any demands on me. Just leave me alone. And that is a sign of, of resignation. So a lot of young men handle the distress that they, that they experience internally. That is, they, they, they handle discomfort. They handle the uncertainty about the future. They handle fear about something that might go bad in the future by checking out. And the slight data is called defensive detachment. I'm going to protect myself from getting harmed by not engaging. So I can't get fired if I don't have a job, right? I can't get cheated on if I don't have, if I don't have a woman, right? If I don't get married, there's no divorce. Uh, if, if I, if I, if I don't try to do X, then I won't get rejected when I if Y happens, right? And so it's 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 causing it's causing this withdrawal that we're seeing, and guys are absolutely checking out. Now here's what they're checking out of: the church, they're checking out of marriage, they're checking out of 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 work. They don't have a lot of ambition. They are they are very unmotivated, right? And these are things that we've seen in some black communities since the 70s really got bad in the 1980s. And, and a lot of that is precipitated by depression and anxiety. Now, here's the context for this that people need to that we need to pay attention to. A lot of that anxiety and depression is precipitated by childhood trauma. OK, now, in fairness, a lot of our young men and women. By the time they hit early adolescence and in into the, the young adult years, a lot of the things that we see them do, a lot of the drugs, a lot of the sexual promiscuity, a lot of the video games, a lot of the hiding with hoods on, a lot of the withdrawal, a lot of the violence, a lot of the impulse control, all those, a lot of those things are precipitated because they experienced real trauma when they were little. Now, that trauma could be they were sexually abused themselves. They were physically abused themselves. Or the, the data says that 80% of child maltreatment is neglect. Now, what does neglect mean? Neglect means that the child did not get something they needed. And that causes a lot of anxiety and, and can facilitate depression when they needed hugs, didn't get hugs. They were in an environment that wasn't safe. They were in an environment that wasn't warm. They, some of them may struggle for malnutrition. 
right? And so, and so what happens is they protect themselves from getting hurt again. They make a vow that I am not going to get hurt again. And so they defensively detach, right? That's called resignation. That's called withdrawal. And so sometimes we look, look at what we see in front of us and don't look downstream or further upstream and see some of the problems. It's one of the reasons why we need to really protect marriage and family and particularly pregnant uh, women because a lot of that that stress and anxiety is is transferred on to their to their children and and that's a major major problem i think in a lot of our in, in a lot of black communities the th there's there's a stigma to mental health and to to admitting that you're struggling and so what we typically do is we self-medicate our trauma we self-medicate our anxiety we self-medicate our our depression, right, with food, right? We drink a lot of red Kool-Aid. <laughs> uh, we eat a lot of fried chicken. We eat more than we're supposed. We eat a lot of snacks. We soothe our discomfort and a lot of the pain we have through food. So we're also seeing obesity issues and diabetes issues and, and kidney failure and hypertension because you have whole traumatized communities who aren't getting the, the, the proper mental health that, 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 that they actually need. And it's really undermining their, their capacity to flourish. And so those mental health uh, issues are really, really large as well. Yeah. Thank you for uh, explaining that. I think it's, you know, something that we're all aware of, but I think we don't necessarily talk about enough in our community. So um, thank you. Um, so I want to touch on some potential solutions. Um, a lot of people on this call are pastors or very involved in their church, community leaders. Um, how can we meet uh, these boys and I think just youth kind of where they are and uh, bring them back in and build them up? That's a, that's a great question. This actually, this is going to sound, uh, it, it, it may sound overly simplistic, but what the data shows and I talk about this in, in my, my book on, on mass incarceration, is that one of the most effective and, and predictive protections against a lot of this deviance is simply love and care uh, and, and hugs. Once a boy knows that, that some other adults believe in him, uh, care about him, want what's best for him, have interest in him, want to encourage him, as the scriptures say, to encourage each other daily. If you break down that word, it, it literally means to put courage into someone every day. That, that if our young men are, are in communities where they are surrounded by older men who believe in them, who are encouraging them, who are affirming them, who are giving them space to struggle, to be honest, uh, to be vulnerable, uh, to hurt, right? If, if that's the sort of context in which boys are experiencing community with older men, and, and the older the better, mm -hmm. uh, those are the, that's the beginning, really, of, of men being protected against some of these pathologies. It's really kind of simple. Yeah. Uh, the church, you could, one way you could describe it is the church is being the church. Right? right. And, and, and instead of, instead of shaming young men because their pants are hanging down or, or they got dreads or they're not doing it right. Right. You know, how church folks sometimes, uh, we'll, we'll shame folk cause they're not doing it right. It, you know, they, they're not standing up at the right time and they had a hat on during the server. They got to take the hat. I mean, th those are the sorts of things that often push them away. Right. But if, but if, if we make, if we make our, our church communities, the sorts of places where young men are validated and affirmed and encouraged spoke, someone needs to be speaking life into them, like prophesying, I would say, goodness and virtue and to encourage them to pursue what the Lord wants them to do and to be about. 
one of the things that they constantly get yeah. is discouragement. You can't do this. You're not good enough. You won't make it. And a lot of our, a, 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 a lot of black men really struggle with wondering if they can, if they can actually do it. Right? Lots of pressure. And what they really need, what they really, really need is, is a community of people to, to validate and, and love them. And secondly, secondly, I really think that our churches need to focus on, on encouraging and supporting marriage culture. And, and I mean, I mean, like <laughs> encouraging people to date each other. I mean, having a night at your church where it's not a sermon, it's not, it's not a, a Bible study. The whole purpose of the evening is to get men and women to hang out and talk to each other, to meet yeah. each other and encourage and, and encourage people to ask each other out. And this is something I do. If I meet a couple and and they've been going out for a while and they're and they're Christians. I'll I'll tell them I will marry you for free. <laughs> right? I'll do it for free. That's I keep it. I keep two in my in my bag. I keep about two or three wedding ceremonies on me at all times. Mm -hmm. And I'm like if we, we if you want to, we'll uh, we'll you can elope in the park. <laughs> I will meet you in the park under the tree by the lake, and we will bring some folks, and I will marry you right then. And and it's happened. I had had a a, a couple call me on a Thursday. <laughs> they wanted to go to the park on Sunday. I met them at the park, and we did it. Right. So so they actually need a lot of encouragement, validation, affirmation, but they also need to be encouraged and supported in their relationships. And I think I think so many men don't know how to do relationships. They don't know how to do marriage. They don't know how to date. They don't know how to be husbands. And, and again, if older men can show them how to be successful at being a man, it will most certainly mitigate uh, some of these other things. The last thing here, and there's really hard data on this. I got this from the Journal of Negro Education at Howard University. Outside of the family, the greatest predictor of children graduating high school successfully is involvement in their church. Wow. That is a that is a a a, a data informed fact. When churches support and, and encourage education with their children, the children graduate high school and a lot of them go on to college, but they're definitely going to graduate high school. It's second to family. How does that happen? A lot of our churches have graduation Sunday, education Sunday. We praise, we bring bring everybody up and pray for them. Those are the sorts of things that reinforce education success uh, for, uh, for, for kids. Those are, the, again, really simple things. But, but if churches really focus on, on love and, and connection and validation and affirmation and, and, again, right, investing in, in our youth, uh, we'll, 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 we'll see them protected against some of these uh, negative pathologies. Yeah, that's excellent. I think... Um... Frederick Douglass has a lot of great quotes, but I think uh, one of his best is it's easier to build up strong children than repair broken men. And um, that happens in the family, but um, I think it also happens in the church and other communities, like you were saying, is having those examples to look up to if you can't find it in your immediate family and just making sure that the church really does come in um, and just, you know, love on everyone uh, in their community so that they can, um, you know, excel. Um, yeah. And, and, and let me just say this one, one yeah. last point. I think a lot of men don't realize they have a ton to offer. Mm -hmm. And and the one thing that young men need from older men is their presence. That's yeah. it. They don't need anything else. They need you to be there and be for them and, and with them. And they'll and they'll they'll soar and be the men that God wants them to be. Absolutely. I can think of. um a lot of times where my own father was that for people who were not uh, his own son. Right. And I think uh, for them, it really has made a difference. They've come and, you know, told me in the last six months how much it meant to them just to, you know, uh, you know, pick them up from the airport or just, you know, listen to how life is going or hopping on a prayer call. So I definitely agree with that. And I've, I've seen it with my own eyes. So I, I appreciate that point. 
Um, all right, well, we have a couple minutes left. Um, I don't know, let's see if we have any questions in the chat. Looks like we're getting a lot of kudos. Um, but yeah, I think we've covered actually most of it. Um, Mariko, is there any, any questions I might've missed there? If you wanna come off mute. Let's see. Her. I am here. Okay, there you are. There were some at the beginning, but I think in the process of going through, he's pretty much answered them all because there was one um, asking about mental illness as it relates to boys and what has been noted. Sure. That. Um, and any, somebody else asked if there were any studies of outcomes from children, children from traditional homes versus same sex homes, sex, same sex homes which is a little off topic, but. Yeah, that's okay. Well, it sounds like we answered most of them. So before I pass it off to um, Apostle Colbrick to um, close this out, I do want to uh, mention two other things. Um, Dr. Bradley has um, a really great sub stack. If anyone um, is into that, we're going to link that in the chat. Um, but the, the article he was most recently talking about, um, about hoodies is on there. I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list. Um, but Kai just dropped that in the chat. So if you're interested, definitely uh, give it a read and subscribe. Um, and then second, um, some of you who are at our Juneteenth event know this, uh, but we have recently started an initiative called Idealized Millennials, which is a combination of Gen Z and millennial age individuals who are really interested in the work of DLI um, and trying to create community um, around some of those shared interests. So we will also drop a link in the chat for that uh, with an interest form for those of you who would like to join that community. Um, but Dr. Bradley, thank you so much for being on. I think this was a really great discussion. Uh, I felt like we were able to cover a lot. Um, and yeah, just thank you so much for your um, valuable insight on all these topics. You're very welcome, happy, happy to be here. Thanks. All right, uh, Apostle Colbreth, I will pass it off to you. All right, Michaela, thank you. Great job facilitating that discussion. Dr. Bradley, we appreciate you and uh, thank you for the valuable information. Um, as we at the Douglas Leadership Institute um, host various events around the country, uh, oftentimes we look for um, uh, volunteers to help us uh, in that regard. Uh, but before I get to volunteers, um, I want to thank you all uh, who donate toward the Douglas Leadership Institute. Uh, we truly appreciate it. Uh, the ministry that we do is fueled by uh, donations uh, from folks uh, like yourself. Perhaps the Spirit of the Lord stirred your heart even tonight uh, concerning uh, donating. Uh, there's a, a screen and a QR code there. Um, that uh, you can uh, capture our secure uh, donate page and uh, sow into the work of this ministry. It is uh, good ground. So uh, I, we'd love it if you would um, consider that you will be blessed. If you're not regularly receiving uh, correspondence from us and our newsletter, uh, I wanna encourage you to uh, become part of our mailing list uh, you'll see that QR code on the screen. And as I started to say a moment ago, we hold various uh, hosts, excuse me, various uh, roundtables and forums and events in various parts of the country. And when we come into those uh, regions, uh, we look for volunteers to help in a, various, in a myriad of capacities. So uh, there's a, a volunteer uh, slide there. And if you'll... Um, if you'll click on that and complete just a, a few short questions, uh, you can get uh, answers and direction on if this is something that you'd be interested in, or perhaps uh, folks within your network that you know that might want to partner with uh, and volunteer uh, with the Douglas Leadership Institute. And lastly, we hold um, very robust uh, and impactful conference each year. This year's conference will be in Atlanta, Georgia, October 24th through the 26th. There's a save the date uh, slide on your screen right now. It will be held at Crown Plaza, Atlanta Northeast and Norcross, Georgia. And we're really, really excited about that. So stay tuned and uh, you can follow us 
on any of our social media uh, platforms from our website to uh, YouTube, um, Instagram, um, X, and, uh, and any number of, of ways that you can connect with us and, and follow along with the work that we're doing. But I'll say, as I started the tonight with, we appreciate you. We thank you for what you do. And um, we pray that tonight's call uh, has been impactful for you and, and just added some additional resources uh, that can strengthen the work that you're already doing. Let me close out our night with prayer. Father, we love you and we are so grateful for all that transpired tonight. Father, we thank you for just the continued uh, information, Father God. And we know that it's not just about information, it's about impartation, it's about transformation, Father God, in our hearts and in our communities, oh God. So Father, I ask that you continue to bless the, uh, the homes, and the families and the churches and the organizations and ministries that are represented on this call, both in real time tonight, as well as those that watch by rebroadcast. Father, continue to bless Bishop Garland Hunt and the Douglas Leadership Institute and uh, our board and our staff and our volunteers. And uh, also bless the Frederick Douglass Foundation, our sister organization and the valuable work that they do uh, especially in the political sphere. Father, uh, bless the remainder of our evening. You get the glory out of it. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you.